it's a pleasure to introduce today Peter Elliott, who's visiting us from the Max Born Institute in Berlin. So Peter and I have known each other for a long time. We did our PhD with the same advisor. So Peter did his PhD with also with Kieran Berg um, at Rutgers and UC Irvine um, a while back. And so Peter is an expert in DFT and time-dependent DFT. Um, he has then spent some time in New York at Hunter College and also some time at the Max Planck Institute for Microstructure Physics. And now he's, uh, as I said, at the Max Born Institute in Berlin. And in the past years, Peter has specialized in time-dependent DFT and developing and applying time-dependent DFT in particular for ultra-fast spin dynamics, which is also the topic of your talk today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So with that, I'll hand over to you, Peter, and we look forward to your talk. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to uh, come here and uh, get to talk uh, to everybody about uh, our work over the last couple of years on, on uh, Abbott Monsieur simulation of spin dynamics. Um, so yeah, I'm at the Max Born Institute in Berlin, in the Condensed Matter Theory Group that's headed by uh, Singhita Sharma. Uh, and we're researching uh, out of our spin dynamics. So the reason we the reason we're interested in out of our spin dynamics is this kind of general technology uh, motivation. You know, you want your computers, your technology to be faster, smaller, more energy efficient. And so all the fast spin dynamics is a way of is, is a way to moving towards that goal. So all the fast for us means well, pico scale, pico uh, second down to femtosecond are TDDFT simulations. Uh, I'll explain what TDDFT is later, but uh, we work on maybe tens of femtoseconds, maybe a hundred maximum. And this is maybe you know a thousand to a million times faster than your conventional electronics that you can buy today. So that's the ultra fast part. The spin dynamics comes because, you know, spintronics is this big field at the moment. Uh, and it, it's just more efficient to work with a spin. Like many processes in technology uh, involve going from you know, spin to charge and back again. And you're wasting a lot of energy doing this. You can also have spin currents that flow without uh, some of the dissipation you get uh, in charge currents. So they're kind of seen as, uh, you know, the, the, the next step. So this whole field of, of fast spin dynamics was kicked off in uh, 1996 uh, by the group of Bowie, Pear and Biko in uh, Strasbourg, I believe. Uh, and what they saw is they, they took a piece of nickel, they whacked it with this femtosecond laser, and they see a change in the magnetization, uh, or a change in their signal, on the order of femtoseconds. And this was much, much faster than anybody had anticipated and much faster than the kind of the normal speed of uh, changing magnetic moments. And this kicked off a, a lot of research into this. Uh, you know, this was for nickel, people did cobalt, iron, and they looked at gadolinium, uh, the uh, rare earths and that sort of thing. And uh, one of the next big steps came in 2012 uh, with this discovery of uh, uh, optical switching. So uh, you, they took this material, it's a gadolinium iron cobalt alloy. You hit it with your laser. In the original work, they used helicity dependent uh, switching. So you hit it with uh, one uh, polarization, circular polarized light, and uh, you see the spin switch. And you hit it with the other polarization, nothing happens. And you could do this repetitively, you could switch it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, as much as you wanted. It's on a bit of a slower time scale than what I'm talking about, but this is, you know, uh, what a big uh, discovery uh, in ultra spin dynamics. The other things like uh, that I'm interested in, like ultra fast uh, spin transfer torque and ultra fast spin hall effect, uh, which maybe we'll get to later. But the idea is uh, these are the kind of things that we want to study, and we want to study them with ab initio theory, and we're going to use TDDFT. So I've put in a few slides to try and explain a little bit about DFT, just so everybody's on the same page. Uh, and after that, we'll 
you know, I'll, I'll give you an overview of the kind of topics, a uh, more detailed look at the topics that uh, I'm studying. So this is a you know, DFT in a few slides. We start with the time independent Schrodinger equation for the electrons. You know, we've already made a ton of approximations just to get down here. So we've made things like the born oppenheimer approximation. Uh, we've neglected spin. Uh, we've, uh, we're non-relativistic. Uh, we'll put some of that stuff back in later. But uh, for just thinking about DFT, uh, we, can, uh, we can just take this Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian here, we have uh, three pieces. This is the kinetic energy of the electrons. This is the electron-electron interaction. Uh, and this is the external potential, which versus the nuclei, so the, the atoms, uh, the nuclear uh, ions. And so this is the Schrodinger equation. You know, here it is in uh, real space. Uh, and so you would just solve this, and you would, you know, get the answer. Of course, it's not so simple. One, you can see this wave function. It's a it's a function of uh, m electrons, and you know three dimensions for each, so it's 3m. So it scales terribly as you increase the number of electrons. And you have this electron-electron interaction, which really uh, makes solving this thing basically uh, not tractable uh, for more than a couple of electrons. So you've got to find some other way of doing things. And uh, you know, there's many different approximations out there. Um, but the one we're going to use is DFT. So DFT uses the density. This is the definition of the density. You take uh, your wave function and you integrate basically out uh, all the other degrees of freedom, and you're just left with this uh, object here, function of the, uh, just one spatial coordinate. And it's basically the probability of finding any electron at some position R in space. Now, the reason we use the density is that uh, Humberg and Cohn proved in 1964 that uh, the density is basically all you need. So they proved a one-to-one -one mapping between the density here and this external potential. Meaning, if you know the density, you know the external potential, you know the Hamiltonian, and uh, in principle, you know all the observables of your system. So Humbert Cohn says uh, the density is all we need. Then Cohn and Sham, uh, the year after, 1965, went a little bit further, and they thought about how to kind of practically apply uh, this Humbert Cohn theorem. And what they thought about was, ah, I can apply the Humbert Cohn theorem for the interacting system. And uh, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the density and this external potential. Or you can map to a non-interacting system, and the, there's a unique uh potential for non-interacting electrons that gives you the same density. And as I said, if you get the density, you get everything in principle, uh, all observables. So this is the Kong-Sham system here. This is, you see, it's non-interacting, so you can uh, all, your, all your quantum mechanics, it separates out into one electron orbitals. So you solve uh, for orbitals in this potential, this Concham potential, and then from that you get the density, and then you have to come up with some observable uh, for the things that you're interested in, or some functional for the things you're interested in. Meaning, you, functional meaning you take the density, it's a function, you feed it in, you do some operations on it, and you get out what you're interested in. And the energy here, normally you split it up into the non-interacting kinetic energy. Uh, this is the classical electron-electron interaction, Hartley term, potential energy. Uh, and then you have this thing called exchange correlation energy. Uh, and you can show that this uh, uh, contract potential, you can write it in terms of the external, this V Hartley, uh, which comes from the functional derivative of the Hartley energy. And then this exchange correlation potential, which is the functional derivative of this exchange correlation energy. So once you, you have to come up with an approximation for this uh, exchange correlation energy, but once you have, you have a kind of a closed system that you just solve uh, to get uh, the density and to get the energies. So, you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. So you you have to approximate this exchange correlation. Turns out, you can do a pretty good job approximating it, but there's no systematic way of doing it. And so you end up with this huge number of functionals out there, this functional soup. So this figure here, this little word cloud here, I made in 2009. Uh, at the time, these word clouds were kind of in vogue. 
and uh, my advisor, Karen Burke, uh, the B in this PB functional, uh, asked me to make it. So I made it and he used it in some talks. I've used it in some talks, used it in some papers. And then it sort of had a life of its own. So occasionally I, you know, sometimes I find a blog on the internet about DFT and they use this picture. And it amuses me a lot because I've put in a little joke. So this functional up here, EB08, this is Elliot Burke 08. It's not really a, a proper functional. It's just a slight modification of another functional. But you see it's the same size as uh, some of the much, much more famous fun functions. <laughs> this functional is actually implemented in LibXC, which is this library of, you know, a thousand different uh, DFT functionals. So you could actually use it, but as far as I know, nobody's ever used it. So TDDFT, so TDDFT is the time-dependent extension uh, of DFT. It uses the same kind of philosophy. Now you have a time-dependent uh, schrodinger like equation. So you're propagating these orbitals uh, in time in some fictitious uh, time-dependent potential, but you reproduce the same density of the interacting system as if you propagated the interacting system. And from that, you get all observables. In particular, you could imagine doing a small perturbation uh, and calculating the linear response. So the, the, the response of the density to a small perturbation in the potential. And if you uh, write this out in this Lehman representation, you can see that this uh, linear response function that contains the excitation energies here. So linear response to DDC is a way of getting uh, the energy differences to the excited states. And for solids, that means you can get things like the absorption spectra or the electron energy loss spectra um, because you're able to kind of come up with an equation to calculate uh, this interacting response from the non-interacting system. And this is pretty much what all the application of TDDFT was until uh, a few years ago. So we, among with some other groups, uh, we started looking at this real-time TDDFT uh, for solids. Uh, we want to you know, do more realistic systems, so we have to put in all the stuff that I neglected before. So for example, now we have spin. These orbitals here are two component poly spinners. That's a street non-collinear magnetization. Uh, we also have a BXC as well as a, a VXC uh, potentials. Uh, this is the spin orbit term here. Uh, you can see that you know, for atomic systems, this VS, it's basically spherical. So this is R cross P, which is L, and this is L dot S, which is probably the way you've seen spin orbit uh, in uh, textbooks. But this is kind of the, the full version of it. And lastly, this A external here, this is where we include our laser pulse. So uh, if you take your laser pulse in the dipole approximation, you can gauge transform it to a purely time-dependent vector potential. And we need to do that because we need to maintain periodic binary conditions uh, in order to apply blocks later on. So this uh, vector potential here is in uh, our laser pulse. Yeah, this is implemented in, in the, the code developed by Kei Juhast and Sangeeta Sharma uh, called ELK. It's open source. You can download it here. And this is the dynamic ELK. Oh yeah, sorry. Th this is the kind of stuff that uh, we calculate with it. So basically just expectation values of our orbitals. Uh, so for example, here, this is the magnetization density for a chromium monolayer. Uh, you know, we hit it with a laser and it, it, it sort of went crazy. This is just a snapshot. Uh, you can also th do things like the, the current. Um, so this is the this is the uh, current density uh, for some system of, of um, I think this was nickel on top of a few layers of uh, aluminum. And you know, we, we hit it with a laser and we can see the current flow. Into the, uh, into the other layers. So this brings me to uh, kind of the, the research topics that we uh, look at with TDDFT. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about all of them, just the ones in bold, uh, but I wanted to give you a flavor of, of the kind of things we do. So this sort of fast magnetization and this thing called Oyster are the things I'm gonna talk about. Uh, we also do things like transient response uh, particularly XMCD, so X-ray magnetic circular dichromism. Uh, basically there, the problem is, you know, we know calculations, we're calculating things like the, the magnetization density or the current, 
Whereas in the experiments they do on the sort of fast spin dynamics, you know, they're measuring responses, they're in this kind of pump probe geometry. They're looking at the response to some optical property, or in this case, x ray property, uh, to a weak uh, probe. And uh, we developed a way to kind of go between the, uh, the two worlds. So we have a real time TDFT, and then occasionally at various time steps, we do this linear response. Uh, to calculate some uh, things like the absorption spectra and to calculate the MCD. Uh, other things we look at, we've, we've tried to look at the effect of phonons uh, to ultrafast demagnetization. We've looked at quasi particle dynamics, uh, particular things like uh, magnons. Uh, we, we've looked at how the magnons react when you hit them with a laser. And then there's the spin hole effect, uh, which I'm trying to study ab initio. This is actually supposed to be my main project. But and I've been distracted by these other ones. Um, but if anyone's interested in them, they're welcome to, to email me or come up to me and ask. So, uh, ultrafast demagnetization, this uh, figure I showed you at the very start uh, from the Rovi Pair Bigo. Basically, any conference you go to on spin dynamics, this figure is always in every talk. It's uh, crazy. But it, it motivated us uh, to kind of look at what would happen. So we, we took iron cobalt nickel, uh, we hit it with quite a strong laser, and we uh, looked to see what happened. And lo and behold, we did see some ultrafast demagnetization. Oh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the time scale got cut off, but this is like 20 femtoseconds here. So this was an extremely short pulse, uh, just a few femtoseconds. And yeah, this is 20 femtoseconds. So we see. We see demagnetization on this kind of tens of femtosecond time scale. And it was interesting that it kind of followed the pulse. Uh, unfortunately, when we compare it to experiment, uh, the pulses we were using were about like 100 times too big. Um, you know, which was unfortunate, but uh, it turns out this sort of vast demagnetization, it's, it's really a collection of many different processes. Uh, maybe one of the most dominant is. Uh, this uh, super diffuse spin currents. So you imagine you come in with your laser, you hit the space, you heat it up, you, you whack a, a, a current just flows away from it. And this current that flows away, it carries some of your magnetic moment with it. Uh, and this, this they've seen in kind of um, front, uh, front pump back probe experiments. You can see there's a delay when the, the current arrives. Um, and it seems to be maybe the dominant process for a lot of the sort of fast demagnetization. But uh, there was an experiment a few years ago uh, with Lee, um, from uh, Melnikov, uh, who's an iron haller, uh, where what they did is they took a, fill, a, few, uh, a few layers of iron and they put it on top of an insulator. So they block this uh, mechanism for demagnetization. And if we compare our calculations, oh, they, they sent us this data. This is the way they do all sorts of post processing. I don't know what they're doing here, but apparently the main curve, uh, the final curve is the screen curve here, uh, which is the magnetization, uh, what they think the magnetization is doing in the sample. And the red curve there is what our calculations showed. And you see we get uh, good agreement. So it's only a little bit of more demagnetization, 5%, but uh, you see uh, our calculations uh, did reproduce the experiment. So I just wanted to give you, uh, that was a kind of how we started in this field. And then we started looking at more complex systems. So in particular, uh, in these Heuslers, uh, we saw this thing called Oyster, which uh, we think you know, we, called, we called it Oyster, just as a kind of a shorthand. I say it stands for optical intersublattice spin transfer. Some people call it optically induced spin transfer. We don't really have a, <laughs> a clear, definition, uh, a clear name for it is well defined. Anyway, the, the, the idea here is you, you imagine starting with some material that has some spins that are localized to some atoms, you hit it with the laser and you see the spin moves to some other atoms. And I hope to convince you that uh, this is not quite as simple as it kind of looks like you, you imagine, oh, I have majority spin here, just moving over here, but uh, that's not what happens. So we start with these Heusler compounds. Uh, the details are not really all that important. Uh, this is the 
poisonous structure here. If it, you, you get, you know, there's 10 things you can put in here, or like 20 things you can put in here, and another 20 you can put in the Z position. And uh, so there's thousands of these hoislers you can make. Um, but they come in these different flavors. So this is the full hoisler structure. This is the one we're mainly going to be looking at. This is a half hoisler. There's also this uh, manganese three gallium, uh, which is the hoisler kind of stretched. Um, it's interesting because it's a fairy magnet. So two of the manganese are the same. They point one direction, and the other one uh, points the opposite direction. So if you look at what happens to the local moment in these systems, so meaning the moment on the x atom, so in this case, the moment on the cobalt, in this case, the moment on the nickel, and in this case, the moment on one of the manganese, the one, the one that points opposite. And you look at what happens when you hit them with a laser pulse. So still too strong, uh, but you know the effect is also crazy here, uh, very large. So you, you can use lasers more, more realistic if you want. This is just to, to exaggerate uh, the behavior. And you see these three, two, three systems, uh, the local moment uh, behaves completely differently. On this nickel, you completely, like you increase it by about 300%. Uh, in the cobalt case, you don't really do anything, and then with manganese, you destroy it. So, in soils, they have a kind of a, a rich uh, variety of things that can happen. So, then we dug into this and tried to understand what's going on. So, this nickel manganese antimony, if you look at uh, what happens to each atom, what you see is yeah, manganese starts with a large moment here. You see, it's, it's, oops, uh, a large moment here. And then the nickel is, is quite small, and you see the nickel increases yeah, by a factor three, and the manganese also drops by a huge amount, and it ends up in this final state. So with our calculations, we can kind of look at what happens to the individual spin channels. Uh, you have to kind of assume your system stays roughly collinear, but we see it does. So we can use this uh, definition here for the number of up electrons and number of down electrons on each atom. And uh, let's just look at this nickel manganese antimony case. You see in the majority spin channel, so you spin up here, you see the blue line goes down, that's the manganese. Yeah, the manganese. Uh, it goes down, and where does it go? It goes basically into this uh, green, which is these delocalized interstitial states. So these are states that are not really localized any atom in particular. But the minority spin channel, that's where the interesting stuff happens. You see that the in the majority channel here, sorry, you see nickel didn't really get any majority electrons like you might have expected. It turns out it's the nickel who loses. So you see this red curve here, uh, it loses minority electrons and the manganese gains minority electrons. So if you lose minority electrons, it means your total moment goes up. You, you can see it in this uh, little picture here. So this cartoon is supposed to be like a DOS uh, in the ground state you see here, you see the nickel has equal numbers of up and down electrons, so its moment is very small. Uh, for the manganese, you see it has lots of uh, these majority electrons. Uh, and then you come in with your laser. So your laser, you can excite some of the majority electron here, goes into these delocalized states. And the nickel, you see you, you lose some minority, it goes to the manganese, so you see its moment goes up because now it's four minus three, roughly speaking. And the manganese, you know, it's gaining minority. So its moment goes down as well as it loses a majority. And this you can see in the grind state density of states. So you just look at the colors here. So this is the minority channel in below. And this is the Fermi level. So below the Fermi level, you're completely occupied. You see, you have this big red blob here. This is a big blob of occupied minority electron states on the nickel. And then you have this big blob above the Fermi level. So you have this big blob of unoccupied states in the minority spin channel localized to the manganese. And all your laser is doing is basically exciting from here to here. So this is, a, this is what we call oyster. It's this kind of non-intuitive idea that it's the minority electrons that are kind of controlling the physics of what's going on here. So 
uh, we made this uh, prediction in Heusler's. Uh, we also had a few other papers where we predicted it in, you know, a wide range of materials. And then, you know, last year, the experiments kind of caught up with us and they were able to uh, show, uh, you know, to get good agreement with, with many experiments. So I'll just quickly flick through them here. So this was in the Heuslers. Uh, this was Daniel Stiles' work uh, doing his PhD in Transit Schleifen. Uh, and he looked at the Heuslers and they see this little bump here in the MOOC signal. And they attribute this to the moment on the nickel going up. And in our simulations, we see exactly the same thing if we use the same laser pulse as them. Then uh, we worked with uh, Andrea Eschelor and uh, and we were both in in, uh, in Duisburg. We looked at cobalt, uh, a few layers of cobalt on top of uh, copper substrate, and again uh, we see oyster basically an already spin moving from the copper into the cobalt uh, at this interface. And again, we we had a nice agreement uh, with the experiments. Uh, also the same uh, when you probe the element specific. So if you use XMCD, you know, you can probe like uh, the 2B to a 3D transition in iron and nickel. And uh, you can basically distinguish the dynamics of what's happening on iron, what's happening on the nickel. And in our simulations, we see a uh, moment move from, uh, oh, we see minority spin move from the nickel to the iron. So the nickel moment goes up, the iron moment goes down, and that's exactly what they saw in their experiments. And lastly, uh, the same kind of thing, so now we're probing this M23 edge in cobalt, so this is the 3B to 3D uh, transition, and this was done with our colleagues at the Max Bond, where they did, did this experiment at Bezzi, which is uh, next door. And they looked at cobalt platinum, you look at the difference between pure cobalt and then cobalt platinum, and when you have the platinum in there, you're allowing these oyster transitions to take place from minority spin in the platinum moving to the cobalt. And so you see much bigger demagnetization uh, when you have cobalt platinum. You can see that here. And that's that's what we saw in our experiments. And now you might say, what can we do with this? Uh, so we, we came up with this idea for switching. Uh, we demonstrated for this little example here. So this is uh, two layers of manganese on top of a couple of layers of cobalt. The manganese, they like to couple antiferromagnetically, so they're opposite to each other. The cobalts, they like to be ferromagnetic, so they all point up. Uh, so this is basically the moment in the, in the ground state. All of these are up, and these are pointing the opposite way. And then you come in with your laser, and you get oyster transitions from the manganese to everybody else, and then the same the other way. All of these guys can give electrons to, to this manganese. And you see you can switch. Uh, it was pointing down and now it's pointing up uh, and so you end up in this transient uh, ferromagnetic like state and this uh, this they're still trying to make and um, test us. so that brings me to the end of the oyster part of the talk um i want to kind of sell you that oyster is this uh, kind of success for tddft in this field that we're able to predict something which was then experimentally uh, observed uh, we say that oyster is basically the fastest means you could have for spin manipulation. We see it in a load of uh, different uh, systems, and it could be used uh, for kind of a switching mechanism as well. So the next part I want to talk about is uh, nonlinear excitations in solid. It's not quite as practical as what I just talked about, uh, but I find it. Uh, and elegant, so uh, I want to talk about it. And the idea here is uh, we have control over the spin and crystal momentum. So this is the brilliant zone here of uh, tungsten diselenide. And basically, I can choose any point, almost any point in this brilliant zone, and I can choose to excite exactly at this point, and I can choose exactly which spin to excite at this point. So normally, you know, you come in with a laser, you don't really have any uh, options here. Uh, it's all determined by uh, the gap at a, a particular um, point in K space. But basically, you know, you, you don't really have any control over where it gets excited, apart from uh, using the, the frequency of your laser. 
putting their new UX site all over the place. And not just at one specific point. Uh, so I want to explain how we did this. Uh, so first I need to say what this tungsten disemolite uh, was interesting about it. So uh, we looked at the mono layer, you see it has this hexagonal uh, structure between these transition metal dicarb carbonates uh, that are kind of in vogue, you know, they kind of came after graphene. So they have the same honeycomb structure as graphene, uh, but they kind of form in this kind of sandwich uh, type uh, structure here. You see the, you know, the cell light are kind of above and you've got the tungsten in the middle. And because of broken inversion symmetry and spinomate splitting, uh, they have a very peculiar band structure. So uh, you see you have K and K prime. So this is the burning zone here, it's just hexagonal, hexagon, uh, but you have K and you have K prime, and these are different from each other. So at K prime, uh, this upper band, this, this, uh, this is your valence band, this, the upper valence band here is completely spin up. Whereas if you go to the K point, it's completely spin down, it switches uh, as you go from K to K prime. Uh, it also has a kind of weird um, spin, uh, spin orbit uh, locking. So basically, if you have helicity dependent light, uh, basically you can only excite, let's say with left circular polarized light, you can only excite at K prime, and with right, you can only excite at K. Uh, it has this uh, kind of unique, uh, just uh, structure that the orbitals here, they, they, they won't excite uh, with the other helicity. So now I, I try to explain uh, strong laser physics in solids uh, because it turns out it's not quite as simple as uh, in like molecules. So normally you think of uh, you know a laser excitation. You have uh, some electrons sitting here in your band. You come in with a laser of some frequency and you excite from conduct uh, from the valence band to the conduction band and you just excite vertically. Now, in solids, you have this other kind of excitation called intraband motion. And what happens here is that the electrons, they, they undergo an effective trajectory in K space. Uh, so basically you can, uh, if the uh, orbital kind of stays adiabatic, you can basically write down that the orbital is the same. Sorry, I just say this. It's equal to the block function of some other k point, which is given by k plus a. So it means if I start at this k point here, I will undergo this trajectory like this. If my a field is, for example, like a Gaussian, like this, so Gaussian means just go up and down. So I just do a trajectory like this. So I go up and I go back. And every point in the brilliant zone is undergoing this motion. So it's following this kind of effective trajectory. Uh, if we look, so this was looking down from the top. Uh, if we look from the sides and look at the bands, what happens is uh, if we're undergoing this trajectory here and we go through the, the, the gap, the band gap point, uh, like a K point, you see, you just move here, the electrons in the valence band, they just move in the laser field and then just come back to where they started. So they moved and then came back. Now it turns out if they move fast enough uh, and they go through a region with kind of strong dipole coupling between the bands, they can be excited. So speed here means, you know, the derivative of this, so the derivative of Vector potential as a function of time, that's just the electric field. So uh, it's saying that in this kind of nonlinear regime, uh, you can get this extra stuff happening, uh, which you can think of in this way. So this is what's called the Lando Zeno transitions. So they undergo this motion in the band, just moving back and forth. But when they get in this region where there's strong coupling and they're moving kind of fast enough, they can hop. They can jump up into the higher band. And so in this example here, you see you move to the A point, you can hop up, you continue on your trajectory here in the valence band. Uh, so does this guy also can do, continues its trajectory. And then they come back, you go through this region again, you can hop up again, 
And uh, in the end, you end up with some electrons excited up here. And in particular, because you have these two different paths uh, to getting into the conduction band, you, know, you can either get excited here or you can get excited here, you end up with interference. So there's a thing called Nando Zeno Stuckelberg interference. Uh, you can see it uh, sort of graphing here. So uh, you see these uh, fringes uh, of light and dark. This is an interference pattern, and this is this Lando Zeno Stuckelberg interference. In tungsten diselenide, you don't see it so much. Uh, it's just not uh, bands are not too flat, uh, so you have to kind of pop it very hard to, in order to see it. Anyway, so that's these Lando Zeno uh, excitations. Uh, in tungsten diselenide, you see uh, if I come in with this trajectory here, it's only the points below the K or K prime uh, that get excited because K and K prime are the these kind of hot spots where things can uh, things can get excited. And you see the place in the Brillouin zone that gets excited depends on which direction the trajectory goes, meaning which uh, polarization your light has. So if I'm polarized in this direction, I go up and go back. I get excited here below the K. K prime, but if I go to the left and back, I excite it here to the right of the K or the K prime point. And you see the spin is opposite between K and K prime, you know, that goes back to the band structure here uh, at the very start. So if I'm starting here, I'm basically spinning down and getting excited. Uh, or if I'm over here, I'm spin up because that's the uh, upper conduction band. Upper valence band. So we have been able to excite away from this KK prime point, but there's still no real control. So the idea we had is to make a hybrid pulse. So we combine our weak infrared pulse, uh, which makes it do intraband motion, but it's weak enough that you don't get these Lando Zener excitations. And you combine it with uh, a circular polarized optical pulse, which is excites you uh, when you're at the K point. And so basically we configure or we tune our trajectory so that we choose a point in K space, let's say here, we choose the value of the uh, amplitude of our vector potential so that basically only the electron uh, or the electron from here is at the K point when our pulse arrives, this is our second pulse. And so it's the only one who gets excited. So if I started here, I would move over here and I would not get excited by this pulse. So it's only the electron who's reached the K prime, or who reached the K point that gets excited. And then after this pulse is over, you know, you continue your intraband motion and you just return where you started from, but now you're excited. And that's what we're able to do. Uh, so you see here, here we choose this K point. This is where we want to get excited. Uh, we choose our trajectory so that this point has reached the K point when our circular polarized pulse comes in and then it comes back. And you see we're able to excite here. If we change the amplitude of our vector potential, we can even excite uh, further away. So this is further away. This is the trajectory it has to go to to reach the K point, and then our pulse comes in. And then on top of this, we can choose which spin we want excited. So let's say I'm at the end point here, kind of in between the K and K prime. If I go up to the K point and I come in with left circular polarized light, I will be excited uh, with spin down. Or instead, I could go down to the other K, uh, K prime point and have uh, the opposite helicity, and then I'll be excited. Uh, with ups, I'll have upspin that's only excited. And so basically, by deciding which K or K prime point to move to and which helicity to come in with, uh, with our optical pulse, we can choose exactly which spin uh, to excite. So I thought this was very nice uh, that you have control. Uh, you can prepare your state at any K point. So that, that's really little K. Any point in the Brillouin zone here, you can uh, choose uh, where it gets excited and what spin it has. 
And this could be used, for example, uh, if you're excited, like this here, it's in some superposition, but uh, as a decoherence, you get this kind of residual current. So this will be a residual spin current you could control. Uh, you can also study, like, for example, photon relaxation. So you excite just at one, exactly one place in the Boolean zone, and then you could watch it evolve in time and study the photon coupling uh, for that K point. And so that's basically all I wanted to tell you. Uh, thanks to all these people, in particular at the MBI, uh, people I work with there, Sangeeta, uh, in experimentalists, and the director, Stef Eisebet, this uh, SFB that uh, Sangeeta is part of uh, is very useful. It's an SFB on ultra fast spin dynamics uh, between Fire University in Berlin and uh, the University in Halle. And then, you know, we've worked with many experimentalists uh, over the past few years. And yeah, with that, I'd like to finish. And thank you for your attention. Here's again this overview of the kind of things that uh, we work on. And uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for your talk.